can't see where the, the oh yeah on there okay okay um, I guess uh, Brian gave a talk last week so some of this uh, 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 it, it probably would have been better if this talk had been before his because it's some uh, 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 repetition of that but I thought I would actually go over this I don't know how um, familiar the audience was with path integral uh, for fermions. There's some people here that are very familiar and then there's maybe some people are not so familiar with it. Um, so I was going to review it and in spirit of the talk yesterday I guess there can be a lot of discussion uh, about some of these points, right? Um, so anyway, um, uh, there's two QMC techniques at least that have been used for electronic structure problems, path integral techniques and diffusion Monte Carlo. And so first just to contrast them, um, the advantage of the path integral technique is that uh, no wave function is needed. And so I've always thought that it would be a better black box because you don't have to think about that wave function. Of course, you still have to think about um, nodal surfaces, and that's what the talk is going to be about, about the nodal surfaces. Um, you pay a price uh, that the sampling is more complicated, so you've sort of, uh, why is the diffusion Monte Carlo, nobody thinks that much about how you do the dynamics, it's just given by the trial function, the Hamiltonian, but the path integrals, you have the issue of permutations, and you also have issues of ergodicity. Um, and I don't know if Severi uh, if uh, Massimo talked about this. He talked about the worm algorithm, I guess. And so, it, you know, obviously, and what Brian talked about has to do with the, these uh, ergodicity issues. Um, now, with the diffusion Monte Carlo, you know, the main, you know, one of the main points is that uh, you have the zero variance principle. And so if you get good trial functions, which uh, over the years they've gotten considerably better, uh, so your energy um, is reduced. And of course now uh, Cyrus and uh, uh, Sorella and some other people have introduced good uh, optimization methods so you can get, you can really optimize complicated wave functions. Um, but, you know, one of the things that brought out yesterday some of the problems of population bias is, is Possibly, I never thought it was a big problem, but obviously in some uh, um, applications it would be a bias. Uh, branching, of course, is inefficient for large systems. I think this was a topic yesterday that um, it doesn't scale so well. I mean, just b the basic fact is if you have a million particles in one particular pair does something bad, the whole thing is wiped out, right? And uh, so that's, that's essentially the inefficiency, right? And you don't, you know, in the Metropolis procedure with path integrals, it, you don't have that one, but maybe you pay the price with ergodicity. Uh, so, you know. Um, and I think the thing I was worried about more is the misestimator problem, and that's going to be one of the themes of this talk is, uh, is the way path integrals seem to lead you to more physical insight uh, and, you know, the, the, this mixed estimator problem is symptomatic of that uh, for diffusion Monte Carlo. Namely, you would be like, you, well, it doesn't, uh, reptation still has fundamentally the same problem. Reptation takes care of some of these issues, that's true. And it's kind of a blend between the two, so it goes halfway there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't, you still have the trial function there, right? And, uh, you know, he, he, okay, so I can talk about counterexamples of where rotation doesn't completely solve the problem, right? Okay. Um, so anyway, um, another, you know, question is whether the, uh, I, 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 sometimes I try to think about in the future what quantum Monte Carlo is going to be useful for, and it seems like disordered systems, which are actually you know, most of the experimentally interesting systems is one area where QMC can be good, not for perfect crystals, but something more like liquids. 
and or uh, you know disordered solids and so forth, be, where you have strong correlation and also disordered, and and there, you know, have some of these things are particularly advantageous. That is, um, the fact that you I suppose you're trying to do a liquid. You know, do you want to try to optimize, a w create a wave function which is going to be good for every configuration of the ions, and then you have to optimize everything equally well for all the ions. So as a method that didn't have that would have some advantage. Of course, it all depends on how effectively you can com come up with trial wave functions and optimize them. Um, uh, but anyway, it's worth having alternatives, right? And of course, the real advantage, I, I guess I forgot to put it here, but the fact that path integrals are already formulated at finite temperature, which experimental systems are as well. So actually, here's an, my example of an actual uh, liquid that we did a number of years ago. Burkhardt did this in his thesis. <coughs> Excuse me. This is um, a case where the path integrals works really easily. Right, because it's a very natural system. It's also a system that is difficult to treat with, say, density functional theory. Um, and you just have a, a system of hydrogen molecules. That in this case, it's at low density. Of course, we did a lot of calculations at higher density. But here is an example. You know, it, well, we have these are our path integral results. And so you just simply put electrons and protons in a box. You know, and you just run the algorithm. And in this case. The sign problem is not very serious because um, in a molecule, inside of a single molecule, H2 molecule, you don't have a sign problem. It's only when two molecules would collide for, in the gas phase would you have a, of, um, a sign problem. And so here is, um, well, it's a function of temperature. You see these are pretty high temperatures, but we get down to you know around room temperature, I suppose, we could easily do. Um, and is comparing with some other calculations, which of course this is more of a test uh, for the method. But we get, you know, we can get <coughs> high accuracy, and now, you know, 15 years later, we could actually get higher accuracy. Uh, you know, we can get down in the range of diffusion Monte Carlo. So this is an example of something that uh, uh, that w really shows path integral Monte Carlo in the best light. I mean, it's like you you have. Uh, no Born-Oppenheimer approximation here. Uh, you have uh, molecules formed spontaneously from a Hamiltonian that you know already. Yeah, Bob? A bit of a non sequitur question, but how often are either DMC or TIMC used for off-diagonal matrix elements uh, transitions, for example? Um, we've done a few calculations of that. And I'm going to briefly mention momentum distribution that we we, we've done it for. Um, and the other application is to calculate exchange in quantum crystals that we use off diagonals for because you can express the uh, exchange rate um, in real time related to imaginary time exchange rates. It's a rigorous mapping. And so we've used it to calculate things like the Heisenberg Hamiltonian in solid helium 3, for example, or electric the Wigner crystal. Um, and then something that's not exactly off diagonal, but it's kind of close, is the winding number leading to superfluid density. I mean, it is diagonal, but uh, for um, you have a, these long permutation cycles, which are off diagonal, if you like. So. Oh yeah, well we have a student working on that, but for bosonic systems. But yes, you could. Did you have a fermion constraint on these? Or mm -hmm. We did. Yeah. And so <coughs> the dash line here is experiment. Is that or is that a different? No, uh, but I, the dash line is a, the equation state model that's used in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's based on experiment. I mean, it's you know, it has kitchen sink kind of thing. You know, it has experiment, it has theory, and so forth in it. See, I, you see, it's quite big range of temperature there. So I'm wondering, you see, at what temperature you have after the system molecules in Well, I don't have. At what point you have? Well, I, I could say. 
right here. So Hundred thousand degrees, yes. That's about when things. The, the uh, dissociation. You 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 have an atomic molecular transition. I could leaf through my slides and find that one, but I, no, you know, no, roughly speaking, mm -hmm. at around twenty thousand degrees, the molecules start breaking up, and okay. about fifty to hundred thousand in this range, the atoms start breaking up. That's well, right. No, in this case, we did them quantum mechanically. It's rather straightforward. That's what I'm saying. We don't have a Born-Oppenheimer approximation. We just, it's just the um, proton paths are 40 times smaller than the electron paths, right? Yeah. By the mass ratio, <coughs> by the square root of the mass ratio. Okay, this is something that we're a little bit proud of. This is the so-called Hugonio. I don't, if you, people don't know what it is, basically if you take a material and you hit it with a shock wave, this is the locus of points that you reach with the shock wave, and this is the case of deuterium. And so in 98, these experiments came out uh, <coughs> at Livermore at their Nova shock, which is now replaced by NIF, and they got p points like that, which were in considerable disagreement with our path integral calculations. Now this is dense hydrogen, um, and so, but luckily, a new experiment came on a few years later, the z pinch at Sandia from Lidson, and so they're right on top of our calculation. So in this case, we were able to show that experiments were wrong, actually. Um, that, uh, and it, we're, not, we're also in agreement with these DFT calculations. And just this year, there have been new um, z pinch uh, measurements, and which have more points. So they, these uh, z pinch ones are these blue triangles that are on top of this uh, of the path integral calculation. So these, this shows you the temperature scale, and this little curve is actually what you're talking about, where things go from molecular liquid to a uh, uh, atomic liquid, and then to a plasma up here. Uh, so anyway, uh, so here we were actually a little bit ahead of the experiment. Now, uh, for you, for those of you that don't know about the method, so I'll talk a tiny bit about the method. Um, so basically, you know that uh, you have this imaginary high path integral expression. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the partition function is given by the sum over permutations of uh, the path integral. That is, this dr means the uh, three-dimensional coordinates, so we're always working in uh, configuration space with canonical ensemble with n particles. Uh, of course, we may have electrons and protons. And then we have this action, which is often given by just the uh, kinetic and potential actions, or something better. Um, and uh, the, po the point is, yes? What's beta? Beta is 1 over the temperature, the inverse temperature. It's something better, Well, um, we use the um, uh, uh, pair action, usually, for Coulomb systems, or for any systems where we actually solve the two-particle problem and we put it into the action. Uh, we, you know, so we have the exact solution, for example, for the hydrogen atom, that it, finite temperature that we put in. Uh, numerically, we have it uh, as a table. Um, now, the problem with fermions, of course, is this minus sign right here, uh, that bosons are easy. You just sample this permutation. But for fermions, we have to carry this along as a weight. And um, because of this, if you just try to sample this integrand here, then uh, and then take into account the weight, the sign as a weight, then the computer time uh, uh, has this factor. The the efficiency has this factor in here, which is the free energy of the fermion system minus the boson system. Um, what is it, epsilon? Epsilon is the desired error of your calculation say, of, of any quantity, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, it does converge mathematically, so if you have n equals 2, you know, this may be a reasonable prefactor, but uh, for any interesting quantum system where uh, this is non-zero, that is, the fermions do something uh, that costs some energy, uh, the Pauli principle, uh, so as soon as you get to low temperature, or the number of particles gets large, this exponent gets very large, and 
essentially becomes intractable. Uh, yeah, they are. I guess the notation is is bad, but yeah, there's a chemical potential. I just did. I just wanted to make sure I understood your statement. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I usually be, I don't know. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, okay, so let me explain this so-called fixed node method or restricted path method with path integrals. This is a theorem, um, uh, uh, or a uh, identity. Um, which I think is really great, so I, I get to advertise it a little bit. Um, uh, and basically, the difference, you see the difference here, this is an exact formula, and this is an exact formula. The only difference is <coughs> in the subscript on the integral. That means you integrate over paths where the fermion density matrix is positive. Um, and uh, I'll prove it to you in the next slide. Uh, and so the curious thing, uh, the problem is that why this isn't a solution to the sign problem is that doesn't give you a way by itself of finding out what row F is because you have it on both sides of the equation. Right? You have it in the uh, uh, limitation of the paths and you have it in the thing that you want to calculate. Okay, So you, ha you would have to do it somehow self-consistently. Um, now, let me prove it to you. Uh, it's very simple proof, although I find some people that are resistant to this proof. I'm not sure I understand why. It's really just almost the same as the proof uh, of, uh, in the first chapter of Jackson on electrostatics. Uh, basically, um, I'm not going to do a mathematical proof. I'm just going to sketch how it is. But basically, the uh, density matrix in non-relativistic density matrix is a solution to this imaginary time block equation, right? Um, the uh, uh, T here is imaginary time, and this is the Hamiltonian here, octree on the density matrix. And these are the initial conditions for this uh, partial differential equation. Uh, they, it's an anti-symmetric <coughs> delta function, and again, our is the three and the coordinate, coordinates of the particles, and P uh, is a permutation. Um, now, I'm, I, I'm leaving out spin, but spin can be treated in these problems just simply as there being spin-up particles and spin-down particles, and the permutations act within either, you know, either act on the spin-up or spin-down. Um, so basically, this is a space-time picture. This is imaginary time, yes? The R P, it's 3N or 6N? It's 3N. But there's no density matrix on Yeah, the density matrix is this R0 here. I'm sorry, this is R0. It's, it's a par parameter in this initial condition. No, you don't. Um, I don't know, is this worth a detour or, uh, I mean, you can express the R, the R0, the other leg of the density matrix, as just the initial conditions, right? I mean, if you have, I mean, I don't know, where do you want to start? Okay. No, it doesn't. It doesn't, okay, it doesn't require a closed path. There is a, with the restricted paths, to jump ahead, you're only going to get rid of the minus signs for a closed path. Uh, that is, if you have a closed, if you're calculating a diagonal observable, you will have no <coughs> minus signs. If you do the momentum distribution, because the, mo the single particle density matrix goes negative, you have to have signs. You will have signs. David, isn't this statement true, or more or less obviously true, if you used, uh, if you used, um, eigenfunction? No. Well, probably so. Um, I'll try. I'll come back. Well, I was going to try to prove it, so maybe that's. <laughs> uh, 
You mean uh, that this, the density matrix, is the solution to this differential equation with these boundary conditions? Well, I was going to say, if you use um, um, the methods I used to use in, in uh, Green's function of Monte Carlo, uh, first passage, if you, use, if you use first passage methods, then this is obvious. Yes. Okay. Yes. I was trying to explain why those methods. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, uh, this is the uh, world line uh, kind of picture. These are the initial conditions. This is imaginary time along this axis. This is space along this axis here. And see these, the red dot is one leg of the density matrix, but then you have these images, which you know half of them are negative and half of them are positive. You know, you have um, odd permutations that are negative and even permutations that are positive. Okay, and so if somebody would, and usually these are the boundary conditions, but if somebody would tell you, well, actually the fermion density matrix um, vanishes on, uh, on these uh, blue lines here, then you can use those as boundary conditions too. It's just like an electrostatic problem that uh, you know the, the uh, electrostatic potential is determined by the voltage on the conductors. It's the same kind of problem, and or the way I think about it computationally is if you if you you know uh, define the density matrix on a grid in one slice of imaginary time, then you can just propagate this equation in uh, uh, in an ideal infinitely large computer up like this like this, and all you need is these boundary conditions at the edge of your domain, right? Usually when you have periodic boundary conditions, you don't have these edges, <coughs> or if you have open boundary conditions, you know, it can go out to infinity. But if you do have the boundary conditions, you just have to solve in this region, and then you get the solution in the entire interior by those regions. Now the question is, if you're doing path integrals, so we want to have a zero boundary condition, this is what Mal is talking about, first passage time. If you want to have a path, you just want to kill any path that goes outside of that red region. You just have paths that are the, in the inside <coughs> of the red region. Now, coming back to your question, this does give you the den correct density matrix here, not only here, but it can give it the right density matrix over here, too, and inside all this red region. If you want the density matrix over here, you have to play some games with permutations, but you can still get it, right? You, you get it by starting a path over here and getting it over here, right? Um, so basically, you put an infinite potential on these boundaries, and it's like absorbing first passage time, right? Um, but we're going to do this in a kind of a metropolis or a, 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 a metropolis scheme. Instead of first passage time, we're going to limit it to paths that are inside the red region. Um, and so that essentially is the, uh, the uh, proof or the sketch of the proof of the restricted path. And it's really, I think it's really great because it tells you for this class of problems that a solution to the sign problem exists in the ideal world. It's kind of like <laughs> density functional theory. There exists a density functional, right? even though we only know some properties of it. Or if you're doing empirical potentials like molecular dynamics, this is the analogy I make to people that are doing like protein simulations, right? They do these, you know, very expensive calculations of protein folding or whatever, or virus docking into a protein. They, they don't really know what the potentials are. They hope that they have some of the physics right and they get about the right answer. And that's kind of the situation we are in. We hope that we get some general characteristics of the potential of the restriction, and that will give us the right answer. Inside of this red domain, we're doing all the exact quantum mechanics. It's just the shape of the domain may be off a little bit, right? Is it clear that the positive domain is simply connected? It, um, it is not, it doesn't, what this, this doesn't require that it does. In fact, it has been proved that, uh, that 
in many cases, it is simply connected. Of course, it's not in one dimension. In one dimension, there's n factorial such regions. But in uh, two and three dimensions, in every case that's been looked at, it is, there is a positive region and a negative region, one, a single positive and a single negative. Uh, it, you know, we've actually constructed a proof but I should say the cases that we've done have been free particle-like. Uh, that is coming from mean field theory or whatever. Um, Does it include superfluids? Um, I don't know if it does or not. But actually, yeah. You'd be surprised if they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, um, it's certainly true if per spin component, but it's also true that those two co are connected together in, in the cases that we've looked at. That is a the, the one case that I proved, actually, the simplest possible one with four electrons, it was true, and we could actually prove that it was true, that there was a single domain. But actually, you know, the, it's an interesting mathematical problem, but it's not clear how it relates to the calculations. I mean, the, the calculation doesn't re rely on whether they're simply connected or not. Because they, all the permutation, the one thing that you can't prove rather easily is what I call the tiling theorem, namely that all the domains are simply copies of each other <coughs> by symmetries. So there's only one sort of domain, and the rest are just, per you can apply symmetry operations and generate all the rest of them. No, because sometimes when you take a permutation, you map it back. You always map it back into itself. You do. We have a. It's 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 actually. But finding ten perfect. Can they be copies of each other? Well, why not? It depends on what you mean. I think you're confused. You would prove that the integral is essentially zero. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, I, the, the positive is not a copy of the negative. It said there's two domains. Okay, so there's a positive and negative. No, 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 okay. All and positives are copies of each other. Of each other negative. negative is and if you apply an odd permutation, you copy the those, positive those into the negative. Different. Yes. Okay. Thing. Yes. Uh, I assume that you're going to tell us that this is uh, second order in... No, we weren't. But you mean in the nodal... In the node surface. Yeah, it, it should be second order, okay. yes. I was going to say a little bit about that, yeah. Uh, just in terms of the implication for the algorithm, naively, if there's only two sectors, you don't have to actually consider even permutations. But if there are... are I don't think that's true. But no. if all permutations map you back in the same place, then why do you have to sample them? Because they contribute to the partition function. You don't. If, if it's the same space, then it's connected. You don't have to yeah, but I mean, why? If, if you the partition space. function is counting the number of paths, there'll be more paths if they go like this, versus a path like that. The different nodal domains are good, uh, so they have different free energies. Okay, so you wouldn't call that a different domain. domain. Yeah. I'm just thinking if it's only accessible by permutation, then it's. Uh, this is this is all. Say this is the domain wall here. Yeah. These are all in the same domain, uh, but there's these are these are you know like this may be the one two three permutation. This is sure. the identity or something. Okay, so but you know. for for Boltzmann ons, you would you might think of a permutation as being another domain. That's that's the oh, okay. confusion. Okay. Yeah. That red domain you see, you have the nodal line going. You see from bottom to top, but why they don't? You mean, why don't you have a domain that ends? I think I proved that you can't do that. I, I simply ask you because I'm not thinking now. I see the other question I have is if this equation is linear, so increasingly can it's also solving for one delta function and then can be added and then they'll be the, the same. So it's a sum, it's an n factorial sum of one the n solution. That's true. Uh, I would say it the following way. You, you apply an anti-symmetrization operator 
You can either do it at the beginning or do it at the end. Just for this proof, I decided to do it at the beginning. But it's certainly what you're saying is true, but then it, 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 I couldn't do the proof that way. But it's true what you say. My simplifying is for the discussion, but anyway. Yeah. Delta function is <laughs> Delta function is not a function? Okay. <laughs> what are we? <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, I was going to give you a little example. It seems like this is already a lot of discussion here, but this is my orthopera hydrogen example. I mean, you always have trouble with fermions of giving an example that's not too simple, and this is actually a physical example. So basically, we, this is a two-particle problem um, that you can have, you know, uh, hydrogen, you can have two protons, you can have two deuterons, or you can have uh, a proton deuteron. So you have three different symmetries in nature, um, and uh, you um, you can have if the proton spins are uh, symmetric, then the spatial wave function is anti-symmetric, and that's orthohydrogen. Um, if the spins are anti-symmetric, then the spatial wave function. We're talking about just the nuclear wave the wave function of the nuclei, uh, not of the electrons. Where the electrons have been integrated out. And we assume that the bond length is fixed. And so now we're talking about paths on the surface of spheres. And so here is my uh, picture of three types of statistics. Um, namely, so again, you have uh, two nuclei, and they're a fixed distance apart to bond length A, and that's the radius of that sphere. And, but it can point different ways in space, right? Uh, and so we're just looking at the, the, um, the bond vector as a unit vector on the surface of the sphere, and it can do a random walk. And if you were considering statistics, you know, it's like the random walk on the surface of the Earth, and it could go anywhere, but we're looking at the partition function, so it returns to its starting place. Um, for bosons, or, which is a parahydrogen case, you have two types of paths because you have this permutation. Either the path goes from R to R or R to minus R to the antipole. And so if it starts out at the North Pole, this, this dotted line is that path. And so if you calculate the, the partition function for parahydrogen, you have to add these two types of paths together. Of course, they might not be of equal weight. At high temperature, the paths are really short, and you would only get this solid path. You wouldn't get the other one. Uh, but at low temperature, you get an equal mixture of both paths at zero temperature. Now, for fermions, which is the orthohydrogen, you want to take th this path and subtract this path. And again, the efficiency of that will go exp become exponentially small. And this is the energy gap between orth and parahydrogen, and beta is 1 over kT. So, you know, this, I guess, Numerically, this is like a few hundred degrees Kelvin. So if temperature is below a few hundred degrees, you know, this is not a very efficient method to subtract them. Now, restricted paths are actually <coughs> exact in this case because we know what the nodal surface is. It's the equator. By symmetry, you know that it has to be um, this condition. These are supposed to be vectors here, but that is uh, when the path gets at 90 degrees from its starting place. Uh, and so you only have paths like this, that is to stay in a hemisphere. Which hemisphere is determined by where they started from? If they started from over here, then you would draw the equator like that, right? Or if they started down here. So it's actually isotropic method. That is, it doesn't, there's not a fixed direction in space because it's determined by the spart starting thing. So if you had a lot of orthomolecules, you know, some of them would be pointing one way and some would be pointing the other way. But the point is that the path is always in generally in, in one direction. And this is a little like, I guess, Shiwei's method of fixing the phase of the, w of the wave function, right? We're fixing the direction of the, of the, um, uh, of the path. Um, so you can, do, um, you can do many hydrogens the same way. Of course, it wouldn't necessarily be exact for many hydrogen because 
the nodal surfaces could be, in principle, they could be influenced by nearby molecules, but in practice they probably aren't. Anyway, so this is an, an example, a very simple example of how restricted paths work. Essentially, we just uh, change how we integrate <coughs> over the path um, and putting in this restriction. Of course, in the Monte Carlo, we just simply, if you try to cross that line, you just reject the path. That's it. Um, you might want to put some sort of action. Um, I'm sorry, can you explain how the negative path cancels? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that. I forgot. Um, the point is that uh, that uh, that's what this picture is here. So here we have um, a positive path and a negative path is the green. So the positive path returns to the North Pole and the green path goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. The point is that the gradient of the density matrix is continuous across this line and that means there has to be an equal number of, of those two paths. The flux of the positive equals the, the flux of the negative. And so we just simply throw out both kinds kinds of paths, and that's why how the restricted path identity works is that the contribution of those positive and negative paths is exactly equal. And if we knew where the dividing line is, there would be no approximation involved in this method. Uh, is that good enough? But anyway, I mean, the, the, you know, the proof was here. I mean, or I can explain more, a little more of the mathematics, but it's basically that the boundary conditions determine uh, the interior. <coughs> so, now here are some of the applications, and I'm not going to really talk about it. The first thing I guess Ethan is going to talk about on Wednesday, uh, homogeneous electron gas and maybe some other things. Uh, we've done a lot of work. The biggest uh, applications have been to high temperature hydrogen which I showed you that uh, Hugoniel graph of. Uh, there's been some recent work by Burkhardt Militzer on carbon at high temperature. It's, you know, it's really a method that you start out at high temperature and you work down. Uh, there's liquid and solid helium, and I guess Jonathan could talk about this if he so chose to, because uh, he's done more of the recent work. We've done recent work on solid helium. Um, Electron hole liquid, John Shumway worked on it. I'm, I'm going to discuss that a little bit. And also, um, uh, there was a student of mine that worked on uh, Bose condensation of, uh, of atoms, which uh, I, I think uh, you know about. Uh, but uh, it, it wasn't a terribly successful application, but I think, uh, you know, in principle, it could be made better. Um, now, uh, I guess we talked about some of these things about the nodal properties. Again, if we knew the the sign of the exact density matrix, then I, I should say here we're only dealing with real density matrices as opposed to complex ones. At the end of the talk, I may have a chance to mention something about complex. Sometimes you do end up with complex density matrices, and this is not really applicable to that. But in many cases, even if it's even more general than in uh, diffusion Monte Carlo, you have real density matrices because uh, the density matrix can be, you know, has gauge invariance. Um, the, the nodes are, if you fixed the starting place, the nodes are a three and minus one dimensional surface. The coincident points or the poly points are uh, three and minus three dimensional hyperplanes. In one dimension, these would be the same, and so that's why 1D problems are easy to solve. Uh, here's what we already talked about, but there are typically only two volumes except in 1D. And at high temperature, you actually know that the nodes are free particle-like. They're actually Voronoi polyhedra. And this is, you can prove that uh, in the limit, in fact, in, in fact, when you get above the degeneracy temperature, they pretty much have to be uh, free particle-like uh, because the kinetic energy dominates in that limit over the potential energy. And so here's a kind of a picture of nodes. Uh, what it's in contrast to the para-ortho-hydrogen case, it, when you have many particles in periodic boundary conditions, it's a little hard to draw the nodal surfaces, but here we fix 49 uh, fermions in two dimensions, 
by these little green dots, and then we just uh, wrote, uh, just you know, colored the regions as either positive or negative. And you see the nodes are something that connect the dots. Um, and they also, there's a wavelength of them, which is like the inner particle spacing. So this is the last particle that's free to roam around, and that's what's coloring this whole figure, right? The last, the 49th particle. <coughs> and, um, and essentially, I if it goes in inner particle spacing, the chances are that it's going to cross a node. And so the nodes are not some, you know, the, they're very contorted, kind of like the inside of the human body of everything wrapping around each other, very complicated. But in fact, it looks like there's many nodal domains here, but in fact, there are only two. What you don't see, we're just moving one particle, but if you moved n particles, you could go. F in fact, in, in my original proof, I, I showed that if you move th three particles, you can go pretty much from any place to any other place by making three particle moves. Uh, you can go to all the other blue regions, basically. And that's specific to two dimensions? Or, or three dimensions. I, do, I don't know if anybody's, it's not true in one dimension, and nobody's ever looked at higher dimensions than three, I guess, as far as I know. Um, it but seems plausible that if you go to higher dimensions, <laughs> just with a few years, Yes, you would think so, yes. <laughs> Uh, this picture is when I emphasize the fact that the difference with the ground state is that the nodes become time dependent, that is imaginary time dependent, and this is important. Uh, that is, it, here is the t this is the infinite temperature and this is the low temperature. And I don't know, so you can actually, if you stay at the same place, you can pass from a positive to negative region just because the time changes, right? Although not if you start at the reference point. Um, maybe, uh, okay, I maybe talk about it. Okay, there's one particular point called the reference point. That's the initial point that fixes, essentially, the sign, the domains. And it's actually rather different than in uh, other methods. In path integral methods, you have a time symmetry. Um, so we lose this time symmetry, um, but it actually, it, it, you can, all the points in the path actually contribute by taking derivatives. You can show that. Um, you can, we actually in practice use two reference points. You can do that. Uh, that is like the black point and the blue point. And that still, you still don't have a sign problem, but if you try more than two reference points, that is more than two points that fix the nodes, then you will, the sign problem will come back in. Now, so, to do practical calculations, uh, we, we may need to make an ansatz. Um, that, so we actually get the a fermion density matrix that satisfies the block equation, except at the nodes. And the problem is at the nodal surfaces, if we have the wrong nodes, then we get a, a gradient mismatch across the nodes. That means that uh, the positive walkers on one side are not equal to the density of negative walkers on the other side. You could say in diffusion Monte Carlo and paths, you could say something similar. And, you, and so you can imagine that the paths could be used to make like a pressure on the nodes that would move the nodes around. But this actually hasn't been carried out, but that's an idea of how you could determine the nodes by, by thinking of them as a kind of elastic m membrane that gets pushed by the paths on one side and the other side until they get into equilibrium. In many cases, you can prove that there's a free energy bound with respect to the nodes, and this is, Mal asked me about second order, and this would be uh, part of that. Um, but w I guess this is a, a mathematical problem which I guess somebody should help me with. And we can prove it at high temperature and at zero temperature that uh, you do get a, a free energy bound. Um, so. I think, and in, in, uh, it's probably true in most cases. I don't know if there's a counterexample out there somewhere where it's not true. Uh, so, you know, there's a temptation to use a variational principle uh, to determine the next nodes. And actually, well, first of all, what are, we actually don't make pictures of the nodes when we do the calculation. What we do is we make a function. Uh, and that defines the node. And what is the only 
function you can use when you have more than like 20 particles is a determinant or a sum of determinants or a Fafian or one of these things. And so, you know, we typically use a determinant of some kind and G uh, would be, for free particles, is a Gaussian. Um, and as I said earlier, this is exact nodal surface at high temperature, that is when tau goes to zero. Um, but at low temperature, then the nodes would go into uh, the product of two wave functions, or the wave function, if it's a 90 generate uh, ground state. Uh, but there are problems, namely, there's no spin coupling in the nodes with this kind of free particle nodes, and no formation of electronic bound states. And I'll show you uh, something that we did a few years ago called the variational density matrix. This is a hydrogen atom. And the question is, what kind of nodes should you use for it? Well, of course, a hydrogen atom wouldn't have any nodes, but suppose you have two hydrogen atoms uh, with, you know, um, uh, like we were doing that hydrogen plasma. Uh, we have a multiple ones. Well, uh, this, is, this is how the density matrix would evolve um, as you go down to low temperature. So this is at high temperature going down to low temperature. And the black line would be the exact density matrix. And um, we made an approximation, which is like uh, uh, the red dots, right? We said, what is the best Gaussian approximation uh, to that wave function as a function of temperature? And so, you know, you could write down some equations that say how, you know, Gaussian has two parameters, namely the uh, center and the width. And you write down equations in imaginary time for the center and the width. And so the wave packet, it's like a wave packet. It propagates from high temperature down to low temperature. And that way, you know, it has the right uh, form at uh, high temperature and a low temperature, and it continuously goes down. And so you could use that um, uh, for nodal surfaces uh, for the restriction only. We're using much better approximations for the actual bosonic action. So inside a hydrogen, mole uh, hydrogen molecule, you have no approximation. These nodes are only used when two atoms collide, if you like, because then you have anti-symmetry of the poly principle comes into play. Yeah. yeah? Why don't you use a better approximation also for the nodes? You could. It's just that this is what we tried initially. Right, that would give you a better bound. Right, yeah, it would. You mean like using like a... Um, Use a pair action to construct it. Well, actually, <coughs> yeah, we, this is, okay. Um, you can think about, um, say, a wave function as being a just, uh, just or wave function times a Slater determinant. I'm just showing you a Slater determinant. You still have the Jastro that has the cusp conditions and so forth. Uh, that uh, You can see the cusp condition, you know, is this little part here. And you still have, the bosonic action still has all that stuff in it. This is just the part, the anti-symmetry part. It's like, remember in the old days of my, with Reynolds, we, we had a wave function that the determinant was a Gaussian, and then we had a Jastro factor to carry the cusp condition. So that's kind of what we're doing here for the density matrix. We're separating out the, uh, the, the density matrix is, is kind of a smooth part it's kind of a, like a mean field to do the anti-symmetry, and then all the detailed potential is in the bosonic action. So I have a different suggestion, which I'll discuss with you later. OK. Um, Jonathan asked me about, or somebody asked me about, oh, no, sorry, this is the optimization. Um, so anyway, it discussed a little bit. Not very much has been done. Actually, um, Shimway and uh, uh, Saad uh, Carilla did a little bit on this last year. Nodal optimization is basically, that's an open area. I'm trying to encourage some of the younger people here to get into this field uh, of um, trying to improve the, um, the method by um, optimizing this density matrix. But you know, you could, certainly it's possible to think about how to, how to dynamically optimize the nodes in the calculation. And so basically, you need to work with some determinant or some other function that has uh, parameters in it, and then try to 
we write down some equations that minimize the energy, say, uh, with respect to these parameters, and then dynamically adjust the parameters during the calculation. Uh, but you know, there's some open questions about what's the best way to do that. So anyway, this is an, oh, I'm getting to talk about the open problems now, so this is certainly one of them. Um, now the momentum distribution, um, uh, of course that's the thing that shows the, really the effect of uh, quantum statistics. In bosons you have Bose condensation, so wh how does that, ha what happens for fermions? And it actually is a, um, it tells you something about the permutations actually partly answering these questions. Um, you know that um, f at zero temperature uh, for free, for uh, Fermi liquid, the momentum distribution looks like this, right? The definition, or one of the definitions of a Fermi liquid is that you have a, a discontinuity and the momentum distribution, right? And what we calculate in configuration space uh, is the single particle uh, uh, density matrix, which is the Fourier transform of the momentum distribution, right? And there's a theorem in um, Fourier transforms that says if you have a discontinuity then in this function, then you have a long-range decay in N of R, right? In fact, N of R uh, has to go like this. And so that would be true, of course, you can write that down for free particles, it's just a Bessel function, right, that function. Um, but in fact, I wrote it down here. This is the asymptotic form at large r. It, it, it's, it's oscillating and uh, it decays algebraically. Now, suppose that you did not have any permutations in your calculation. That would mean, okay, okay, sorry, back up. How do you calculate the moment of the single particle density matrix? You calculate it by taking your paths and you cut one of them open and you let the two ends go apart. Now, if you're at a temperature beta, the farthest they can get apart is the square root of beta. I mean, if the temperature is t, then the farthest they can get apart is uh, t to the minus one half. So you could not ever get this kind of decay here. Um, so the only way you can get that decay is by having infinitely long permutation cycles. Um, the, and so that says the permutations have to come into your calculation of a Fermi liquid. If you want to see, if you want to see this discontinuity which defines the Fermi surface. Um, so, and then the second thing that it tells you is that negative permutations have to come in because how else could you get negative pieces for N of R? And that's, again, because um, well, when you have the, you only get rid of the minus signs by working on the diagonal. We can prove that on the diagonal, so I don't know if how many people are familiar with this single particle density matrix, but you basically have a part, of, uh, a path that starts at R1 and then all the other particles and then you have your propagator, and then it goes to R1 plus R, and then all the other particles. So you take a path that starts w where the first particle starts here and ends up a distance R away. And the only way you can get that is having your first particle go there, and then you're having a long permutation cycle involving lots of other particles, and then you end up far away. So that shows you. That those if you want to describe a Fermi liquid, then you have to do some, you have to have paths like that. Um, and we actually did a calculation like this, at, uh, which was never published, but it's on the archive of the momentum distribution, but it wasn't too exciting. I mean, it's like, you could, uh, for finite systems, the momentum distribution, <laughs> you know, it just looks like that. So it's kind of, it looks a little bit different than the Gaussian, but not terribly different. But anyway, this is theoretically, you'd have to have these cycles. Now, 
exciting thing, is, I think, with restricted paths is maybe it gives you new ways of, of looking at things. In the last few minutes, I'm going to mention a couple of them. Um, you know that liquid helium-3, which I view as the, the model highly correlated Fermi system, and uh, I, somebody was telling me they're having trouble publishing things in liquid helium-3 now, which is a kind of a shame because it seems like uh, something where you could, oh, you were telling me that. Uh, um, it seems like it's a case where you have very clean experiments, you know about what the potential is, and it's highly correlated, and you don't have a lot of garbage coming from the ionic lattice and all this stuff, but anyway. Uh, but it becomes a superfluid around one millikelvin, very low temperature, that is a thousand times lower than the Fermi uh, energy. And um, Again, this restricted path gives you an exact mapping of a quantum system onto a classical system. It's true that we don't know what nodes to use, but they do exist. And they, are, they cannot be that complicated, I think. Uh, uh, that you, know, you sort of know what they are at high temperature, and you kind of have an idea at low temperature. Um, and so the question is, you can ask what happens to the path at the phase transition. And what happens with, with bosons uh, at, a, at the Bose transition is you get these long winding exchanges. And as I just showed you, that's characteristic of a Fermi liquid. And so that's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to get in helium at 2 degrees Kelvin, these long exchange cycles. You do not get a phase transition. But I think what happens at low temperatures is you must have a pairing of these paths, and particularly if you have spin up and spin down helium atoms, you know, I call them a red and a green path is spin up. So each one of these paths consists of, of a macroscopic number of helium atoms exchanging. And so you can think about them as, as a, a red and green uh, yarn or whatever. And so what happens is that they must bind together a red one and a green one. And that's what a Cooper pair is. I mean, it's always been kind of mysterious to me how you could have Cooper pairs that were separated by thousands of atoms apart. And how would they, what, what sense does it mean to think that they're actually paired together? And the, the, here, this, there's a precise meaning, namely that these long exchange cycles are paired together. And this is the pairing distance, and that, since it, it, it can involve many atoms. You mean by that that there is some, I mean, what you have on, uh, along the x-axis is what? The, the, the That's just space, no. This ah. is uh, all space here. Okay, okay, so yes. Fine. This is just a picture in yes, the cartoon, I should say. The, and you're in whatever phase has... This is an, yeah. this is an S-wave picture, I should yes. say. <laughs> yeah, okay. Small That's detail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, a P-wave would have, would have some they, they would have a, directionality to it, right? A bro another broken symmetry. And so the, the amusing thing about, about this is that um, you can see that coupling in the bosonic partition function mm. because it doesn't actually require the mm -hmm. sign. In fact, that's one of the things, you know, from the sub, the, the Jonathan yeah. question mark, I mean, that was, yeah. we expect that, that picture that we're using to break down exactly when you have pairing because you would then I mean, in, in the, yeah. because then you, ha you have a correlation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Up in the bosonic yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the neat thing is maybe to get superfluidity, you don't even need to worry about the sign problem. You can look at the bosonic problem because you have to have the same pairing mechanism. Maybe. I'm not sure. But that's one to buy. Did you have a question back there? Or? Yes, what's the problem with the resistance? Same thing. Okay, okay. okay. One of the things is that there's this, these, these not very good. I don't like them too much, but they the relate the, the discontinuity of the Fermi surface to the, to the Bose condensation of the, or the, the superfluid. We're talking about bosons or fermions? Both. There's these things that, uh, where, <coughs> where, where there's a relationship like in mass three, if you do the mass three boson uh, uh, condensate fraction, it's hand wavy related to this oh, really? pairing to this thing, which of course your picture 
mm -hmm. has some uh -huh. indication. Mm -hmm. There were some calculations that people made ugly hand waving arguments. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I do I remember the helium four things that there were things relating like structure factor or G of R is to the or S of K to the. There's this fermion boson thing that yeah. I wondered if you thought about that. No, it wouldn't be. Is there a question now? Okay, we did actually a case. We said, well, we want to try this out, so what's the easiest case? And this is actually what John Shumway did. Um, and we actually, the, the this was simply, um, you can think about them as electrons and holes in a semiconductor. That is, so you have a, a Coulomb interaction, it's like, or so you can think about it as like hydrogen with equal mass protons and electrons, or electrons and positrons, so that the, you know the um, positive particles you know have a Coulomb interaction; they repel each other, and the negative particles, and then you have an attraction. So, um, and so we actually. Uh, got a uh, something like a phase transition um, and here's actually what the paths look like oh. the paths look like um, and so these are actually a real um, paths and not a cartoon but you see here is actually pairing so the difference is the pairing energy is very large in this case um, so this is the um, BEC side of the transition, uh, basically you get a very strong, you get a, like a hydrogen atom forming or a, 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 a positronium forming in this picture. <coughs> and, but then you s occasionally see that, uh, uh, say an electron will leave the pair and come back later on. Um, you know, you get some sort of complicated things. Uh, and here's an example of, so this is a winding exchange. Uh, windings means the path come out, go, come in one side of the box and go out the other side of the box, the periodic box. And here is not a winding path; it just involves um, uh, two excitons. Uh, and so you, you can think about it, this is like heli helium four atoms, which is a boson, right? You helium four atoms, you got an alpha particle and two electrons; it's a boson. But it's made out of fermions. It's made out of uh, uh, of electrons and protons and neutrons. But they're all so bound together, you can consider them as bosons. So you can consider these things as bosons, right? And they both condense. And um, what does the 316 mean to people? Um, that means that uh, there were three uh, three um, electrons, the blue ones, and there were six lavender particles, the holes. I think that's what that meant in that exchange that we followed. So it wasn't completely symmetrical because this guy left for a while and came back. Uh, and so we actually calculated some interesting quantities, namely this, these winding numbers. Namely, you can calculate two different winding numbers which correspond to uh, mass superfluidity <coughs> or charge superfluidity in this case. And so you can have the winding number. If you have the A particles and the B particles, you can have winding numbers of A and B or the difference, right? And um, whether they carry a current or not. And so here it is showing you know, the superfluid density for those two types of observables. And okay, so um, what I wanted to say was the you you do have to think about the nodal surfaces here because if you just use free particle nodes you will never get pairing and I think you gave a talk about this is that right uh, a few weeks ago Kevin uh, yeah well, I did talk about yeah pairing wave function so basically you can't you can show that you can't get pairing if you just do free particles because these spins can't stay next to, well they can't uh, have this kind of exchange uh, I if you have just free particle nodes because there's no coupling between the A's and the B's. And so there, there's no holes in the topology of the neural surfaces. And so what we use are pairing density matrix, uh, which is, I think, what you talked about, a product of something like that, 
we uh, explicitly pair them. Now there's an unsolved problem, namely how you can go from what you know is the exact high temperature form down to this form and keeping it as a single determinant. And we were never able to succeed in doing that, actually. And I don't know whether that's a problem that anybody can solve. Oh, it's, it's not that, I mean, clearly the exact density matrix does that. It goes from a Gaussian at high temperature down to a Gaussian at low temperature, but the forms of them are different of the Gaussian determinant and they have different symmetries. And the question is how they can go from one to the other and still stay as a determinant. You need some shaders. What? You need some shaders. You need some shadows? Oh, that's an idea we didn't <laughs> pursue, but. That's the part I don't quite understand, because in effect, the, the restricted path is a shadow constraint. Yes. It's not a local and imaginary time. So I could see how you could say you can't get pairing with, with a local fixed node. But I don't say, understand why you can't get pairing with a free particle node. <coughs> Well, I can explain it to you, but yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, no, 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 we can do it later. Yeah, it's it's like if, if these are the A's and these are the B's, and you want to go, f you can. There's a positive region, say here and also here, where they both exchange. It would involve going right through there, and that's the set of measure zero, basically. I mean, I can explain what that picture is, but basically, there's no way that they can go where the A atoms have to exchange at the same time that B atoms exchange. And the chances of that exchange happening at the same imaginary time is zero. And that, that, that's the essential idea. And the true nodes open up a hole here. And the pairing nodes have a hole there and they can go through. That's the one minute version. <laughs> And you could show, actually, a brilliant atom exactly how that happens. So going back to the previous issue about uh, the number of uh, nodal pockets, does it mean that in general the pairing reduces the number of... Uh, yes, it does. Okay. Well, there's a speculation by Mitas. He, Mitas says it's a proof, but I don't know if it is. But he says that any interaction opens up a hole there. Okay. And never quite... It seemed like more of a tautology <laughs> than uh, yeah. <laughs> that. I, it seemed a kind of circular reasoning to me, but uh, I don't know. It, certainly, in the cases we've looked at, that's true. But I think it's proven that in principle, at zero temperature, each type of interaction will give a pairing either series or sequence. It's at zero temperature. Yeah. Well, that if that's is that really true? <laughs> I'm, okay. I don't know. I, I'm not familiar with that. I, I think it's called. called Okay, okay. Well, I'm running out of time, I guess. So. This is just, it's, I, I, maybe I will go over this complex one part of it. Oh, I wanted to, this is a pretty picture. Uh, <laughs> this is from Kruger and Zanin. Uh, uh, published this a few years ago. And um, <coughs> they have this, this uh, very speculative paper about quantum, criti quantum critical points, like in heavy fermion systems. And, you know, they, I'm, I'm trying to search for how you interpret restricted paths. And um, they make this the statement the collapse of the Fermi liquid at a quantum critical point, as observed in heavy fermion metals, is necessarily associated with a qualitative change of the nodal surface from a smooth to a fractal geometry. So I, this is something I'm not sure I believe. I, I think that the nodal surfaces should just kind of smoothly evolve. But anyway, they came up with some nodal surfaces that in do, indeed do have a fractal geometry. So uh, you probably can't see this. But this, these are actually nodes coming from a backflow function, which some of you know what that is. Basically, you take a free particle uh, nodal surfaces and then the free particle coordinates you change into quasi-particle coordinates by using something like forces by pushing them around. And so you have a backflow function. And mostly when we use backflow functions for the electron gas or helium or something, they're actually fairly weak backflow. It's not, uh, they're, um, uh, the, the nodes don't move very much. But they took the same functional form and then really pushed them, made them 
the backflow very strong. And this A parameter, which I can read and you can't read, is zero here. So these are the, this is the, just the free particle nodal surfaces that you saw earlier. And then it, it, the A parameter, which is the strength of the backflow, increase until the strongest value is equal to one over here. And then you can see that the nodes get, do get completely twisted around and distorted and what do does indeed. What mean in this context? I'm, I'm having some well, the I will have to, we'll have to look at their paper okay. and basically they're looking, well you can look at like a surface to volume ratio, right? But I think what they're looking at is, um, you know, how twisted and curved up they are. Yeah, essentially, I don't remember exactly what they did, but it was something I mean, like that. Okay. They can't be practically right. I mean, they didn't find the backflow that minimizes the energy no. or anything like that. They just that turned it up. So why, is, why should anybody care about this? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it's an interesting speculation. It is a question about whether, you know, there there's something embedded in the nodal surfaces that has to do with the physics. And so I think that's why it's kind of interesting. But, but why do you think this? Well, why do they think this backflow has anything to do with reality? Because it's just a flip flop function, right? It's right. not minimizing anything. Right, right. I think what they would argue is that on a longer length scale, it is important, and they were just constrained by. Uh, computers to work on a fairly small length scale and a longer length scale. I mean, with, when you do any calculation of fractal dimensions, you have to go to a range of dimensions, uh, of scales, right? And they, they were probably only able to do like one order of magnitude. And so, and that forced them to use rather unphysical functions, that's true. Yeah, I think that's yeah the point that Cyrus was making. Yeah, yeah, but the question is whether you could keep the it smooth on the inner particle scale and make it fractal at larger scales. Maybe it was their point. Yeah. Well, there should there should be a cutoff at 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 the scale of inner particle spacing where they still say smooth, so that would uh, satisfy. No, they're, they're only going to be fractal over a certain range of distances, right? But anyway. So as you go to the right, we're supposed so it's tuning a backflow parameter, mm -hmm. but the underlying Hamiltonian we're supposed to think of is like RS is growing or. No, in this particular is. picture, there is no real. Yeah, you, you might think that it's supposed to be uh, growing uh, as it gets more correlated, but I don't think they did it that way. I think they just took a sequence of wave functions uh -huh. and not, not trying to say that these are wave functions for a particular system. Well, it's supposed to model a quantum phase transition. Yeah. Right? Somehow there's a right, right. Hamiltonian that's changing. Yeah, right? yeah that's right. Okay, so we can have a break. I it, we'll close with this. Is uh, this one? Uh, I think restricted paths are, um, are really great in that they maybe can lead to some physical insight into quantum systems because they map them onto classical systems. I mean, we use them for computation, but it would be nice to use them for understanding. And in the case of the boson systems, of course this has been helpful about uh, uh, understanding like what a super solid could be or what a uh, superfluid it would be. And so there's a kind of a, a, a quantum vocabulary here and then there's a <laughs> classical vocabulary of the restricted paths. And so the blue ones are, uh, well there could be either bosons or fermions, but the red ones are sort of the fermion ones. And, um, and so we've actually proved a few of them. I explained about the Fermi liquid <coughs> is related to winding paths. Uh, poly principle is related to restricted paths. Cooper pairing perhaps is due to paired fermion paths. Um, 
our pit, I guess I should have said paired path, restricted path. Um, and insulators you can show, uh, if, if you take an insulator like, a, I don't know, a semiconductor like silicon and the electron paths, uh, they can involve exchange inside an atom or exchange with neighboring atoms, but because there's no uh, 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 Fermi liquid in there, their insulator, all the exchanges, the probability of a long exchange has to drop exponentially with the exchange, of it, with the size of the exchange. And that's what, it, that's what a band insulator would be or a mod insulator. So that gives you another insight of basically you can get, um, you can get some exchanges but not really long ones. And so I think again for the, the young people here it would be great if we could enlarge this vocabulary and we could find other mappings from uh, uh, the quantum vocabulary to this classical vocabulary like, um, well, like some of the other uh, hot topics in, um, in, in our uh, condensed matter physics. So anyway, I'll stop there. Well. You need birds, you cannot make statements out of nouns. So. <laughs> Verbs? Okay. <laughs> Well, if I took all frequency, exchange would be a verb. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, okay, that's a good suggestion. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.